We are at an undisclosed Bitcoin mining farm that's using immersion technology. And there's a lot of miners in here, 500 Bitcoin miners. Let's dig into it. Hey, boss. Hey, Dennis. Good great, to meet you. Great to meet you. Could you tell everyone just, you know, who you are, what you do, and then we'll go into the farm and, and how all this runs. So super, super excited to uh, show you today's farm. This is an immersion mining farm. We have 480 S19s. One of the unique things is uh, you can actually hear. So that's one of the nice things about immersion mining is it keeps the, uh, the noise down quite a bit. So we'll go ahead and go through that. We are currently located just uh, north of Richmond in Virginia. So we have to deal with heat even though we're in an immersion mining setting. Well, I gotta say, I really enjoy just how quiet it is because, you know, going through some of the bigger air-cooled facilities and even my own air-cooled miners, it's so loud to the level that it's damaging your hearing, whereas this is more like the hum of, like, probably your air conditioning unit. Exactly, uh, and yeah. And it, it's, it's a lot nicer to be around for this, too, but even just... I can only imagine, like, from your point of view, is operating this. Working with immersion has its own challenges, but... Um, but noise is not one of them. So this setup is a, a setup from a company out of Poland. It is DCX. Each of these are independent units, if you will. Um, they're, they're stack three high, they do have a four high model. In each one of these enclosures are eight S19s. We'll show you that in a little bit. We have 20 rows. So 480 S19 miners are running in this facility with no noise. And so at this level, with your, with your build out here, can, do you have additional capacity? Like, could you add another row of these if you wanted to, or are you limited on electricity? I guess, how do we get to the 480 and is this, you know, the completed build or are there additional plans? So um, at this point in time with the price of Bitcoin, this is probably where we are right now, but we do have the ability to expand. Our power company, Dominion Power, has indicated we can get two and a half times what we currently have here in capacity. We would just have to decide whether we go with immersion, whether we do cargo, you know, container type of setup, whether we do water cool. There are a lot of different options, obviously, but uh, from, from the standpoint of power, we can bring additional power in. And would they do that for free based on your additional demand? Again, it really depends. You have to submit a load letter to the power company and based upon what they think they're going to charge you every month, that determines whether or not they'll be yeah. willing to put that uh, that infrastructure in for free. When we walk outside, we can show them how close you are to the actual uh, yeah. the actual lines. It's, it's not a long run. So, so we'll go through um, these setups. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I do want to show is that all of the dielectric fluid that is contained in the enclosures stays in the enclosure. So. It comes up, it heats up, it'll come through, come over to the lip, and then go to the heat exchanger where the water system will then cool the fluid. It'll come back through and just keep cycling through. So there's no actual dielectric fluid flowing through any of the pipes. The only thing flowing through pipes is standard water with a little bit of glycol to uh, make certain that we don't freeze during the winter. It's very industrial looking, like in, in like a very cool way. I just think immersion has such a presence, like air cooled when you really dumb it down is just, these are boxes with fans on them and it just moves air. But you look at this, obviously there's the internet infrastructure, there's the electrical infrastructure that gets more technical as you scale an air cooled mining farm. But like looking at the liquid piping here, it looks very cool. It has just quite a presence and in a way, it, it feels like you go, you're going to a higher league, like you're adding a whole additional element um, when you add the immersion. And really, I mean, could you tell us why? Like, why go immersion? What's, what's the benefit? So a couple of things about immersion. Um, number one, if everything is balanced properly, you're able to maintain that temperature much better because where your heat is really being dissipated, we'll, we'll show this a little bit later, but is in the dry cooler that's actually outside the building. That's why it's so quiet in here. The second thing is that you can overclock these because the cooling system is so good and you can get better hash rate out of that same power consumption. So what model miners are in here? All of these are S19J Pros. Okay. Um, there are a few S1996s that were, you know, one of the first batch that came in. 
but most of them are the 100, 104 terahash units in here. We, we actually just purchased some new S19 XP 141s and we'll be adding those to this setup probably within the next two weeks. They run 104 terahash a second, which is basically like the mining power. You can think of like a car and horsepower. Like if you have more hash rate, you mine more Bitcoin, it's more powerful. And then you have the expected power draw on those miners, it's probably like 3,200, 250 watts or so when you're running it air-cooled with the attached power supply. This is immersion and you're overclocking these. So what kind of hash rate are you getting and what kind of power draw like, like what, you know, what's your percentage gain? So right now at this particular farm, we're running about 46 petahash. Electric bill is in the neighborhood of roughly $2,200 a day. So it's not cheap to run this facility. Right now we're in the hot period of the, the year and we're maxing out our heat situation due to the fact that we're having a little bit of issues with our dry cooler. We're waiting on some warranty repair aspects. So we're down two fans within our, our dry cooler. We're running Brain software here. And one of the things that we've implemented was their new dynamic performance scaling. It senses how hot the miners are and actually starts to downgrade the power consumption by whatever setting you have by default 300 watts. Uh, and if the miner continues to get hot, it keeps going down until it hits that bot um, bottom level. To compensate for that, we've written some software to automatically crank it back up. So we're running an overclocking during the evening hours when it's cooler. So we're actually running anywhere from 33 to 3,600 watts per miner. We can go up to close to 5,000 watts. So you said 40, about 46 petahash for the whole farm. And like one petahash is uh, 1,000 terahash, which is you know roughly 10 of the current generation Bitmain amp miner S19s, which are arguably the leading Bitcoin miners of this era. And so when you're overclocking these, in, you know, let's say their base hash rate's 104, what kind of performance gain like per miner are you getting? Are they going up to 110, 120? So it depends on the miner and the placement in the enclosures because there are some areas of the enclosures that are a little cooler than others. So we crank those up even higher, but uh, we're getting anywhere from 118 to 124 terahash out of a 104 model. That's awesome. So I mean, you're seeing like a 15% gain, all made possible with the immersion because otherwise it would just be overheating. Exactly, and, and obviously a lot more noise and we don't want to add that in the particular environment that we're in. And one of the things that we're pretty fortunate to have with this build out is we actually have these smart PDUs. I was just going to ask you about them because these look good. These are awesome. These are three phase smart PDUs. And what happens is we have a user interface to every single outlet remotely. Because um, I've written my own management software, we actually pull the stats on every miner as to what the hash rate is, what the temperatures are, and what the power consumption is every 10 minutes. So we can get a performance, what the temperatures are, and what the power consumption is. Miner that might not be performing as well as others. Maybe it's due for maintenance. Maybe we need to pull it and replace it with another unit, etc. So when we look at the unit, is each plug a miner? Is it, you know, it's yes. just that simple, right? Yes, there are special plugs. Um, this comes out as one outlet, and then at the other end of that cable, it actually has two prongs that will, the both ends will go into an S19. So just one cable per S19 miner. I've got to put some respect on your wire management. Like this, this looks good. You have the wire management ladder up there too. Uh, you know, you ran your electric in conduit. Doing this takes so much more time than people realize. We wanted it to be nice. Uh, you know, you want to be able to maintain it. We're pretty proud of, of how the build out came out. Yeah, and you just leapfrog between the PDUs. Yeah, so there are two PDUs for one row, one stack of immersion units. So these three enclosures are powered by these two smart PDUs. What's the cost on a PDU like this? So we have a great relationship with uh, a company in China that uh, produced these. The price actually has come down as everything did when we started this build. It's around $800 for one of these three phase uh, PDUs. Okay. But we can go down through here if you'd like and yeah. talk about the power layout that we've got. And yeah, let's check it out. You.
If you're looking for an easy way to earn passive income with a computer, then look no further than the Evergreen Miner. It utilizes hard drives. It has an easy to use app that will help you get set up quick, but it also lets you manage your coins from the app. The coin you mine is easy to trade on numerous cryptocurrency exchanges, so if you just wanna put dollars in and take dollars out, easy. Me personally though, I'm hodling, cause I think the upside's there on the miners and the coins. Link in the video description below, but don't forget to input the code VOSCOIN to save some coin. As you can tell, we have a lot of power and it, the nice part is we bring the power over into the smart PDUs, keep that all separate. And what we have are 10 different service panels. Each one is providing 400 amps of power. So we've got the four main breakers, one for each one of the PDUs. And then these breakers up here, or I'm sorry, down here, uh, are used to power the three phase pumps that the back of each enclosure has to actually keep the dielectric fluid circulating in the enclosure. Okay, and so, so you're on three phase electricity, but which one? 480, three you know, four, phase. You know, 480, three phase. Yes, okay, and we have 10 of these service panels throughout. That is all powered by our switch gear. So this is a 3000 amp main breaker out of the switch gear. Each one of the PDUs has a 400 amp circuit breaker here. And then we have smaller circuit breakers for the two pumps that pump the water to keep everything cool, as well as our dry cooler that's outside. And how has this performed for you? This is working very well. We did have a little bit of an issue, but Eaton really stepped up to the plate, took care of us, and um, it, it, took care of any of the issues that we had. To hear that you had an issue and they stepped up and knocked it out, I. Honestly, that's really cool because so many horror stories are from when a piece of gear goes down, piece of infrastructure, and then it's, you know, you're waiting weeks, months, you know, over a year. And something like this is critical. Absolutely, and quite honestly, the lead time on a new one of these at the time was anywhere from eight to 12 months from when it had its problem to when it was back in operation was two weeks. That's an incredible turnaround. Uh, uh, unbelievable. I didn't think it was going to be done that quickly. The other thing we have are, are our pump system. And the pumps are controlling the water flow throughout the main area of the miners to keep the heat exchangers cool, as well as going out to the dry cooler we'll show you in a moment. And we have two pump systems running in a master-slave situation because you don't want to have one of the pumps go down Losing all your cooling water, now all of your miners are getting overheated and burn up. So what happens is these are two running in master-slave mode. If something were to happen to one of these pumps, the other pump would automatically kick in. And in order to increase the longevity of this, they actually switch back and forth periodically. One will become master, the other will become slave and swap back and forth. So And, and so to like really, really dumb that down, like another way to kind of think about that is you have one pump functioning and the other one is sitting there as a backup, right? And, and, then, and then you're cycling them to reduce the wear. Absolutely. Um, so that yeah. it's not one that just worked for two years and that guy has just had the free ride. Exactly. Walking around here can be somewhat treacherous because you do have a lot of plumbing and steel super strut, so. Is that why you built this bridge? We built our little bridge here. Will not go anywhere, nicely constructed. So what we can do is show you the actual inside of one of these enclosures so you can see the actual miners mining okay so we'll re take off the retaining clips so they don't come out unnecessarily you're earthquake proof yeah these are not light so you have to have a carriage to bring them out on You can see the dielectric fluid here. So these are your S8, S19 miners. You can see there's 
a little flow here. That's simply due to the heat coming up from the bottom. The dielectric fluid then rises. As it comes up, it goes and flows over to the back where it meets the heat exchanger, cools the fluid, the fluid comes back in the bottom and just cycles nonstop. Are you running the power supply fans? No, there are no power supply fans here. So just the grills are on there? And, and we've actually taken the fans that you would normally have in an S19 in an air-cooled environment. We take those off for the front and back because we don't want that, uh, that friction that it would cause and just not really great for them to be on. It's always so counterintuitive to just see a computer in a liquid. It's yeah. just like, what are we doing? Yeah, you, you don't want to just fill this up with water. Um, no. You definitely need the special fluids. Uh, and there are a number of manufacturers out there that are making some really high quality fluids that are not harming the, uh, the electronics at all. What fluid are you using? So this is dielectric fluid that actually came from DCX. Okay. So it's, it's their, their fluid. And then we can show you the dry cooler that is cooling everything. So outside, this is the dry cooler. As you can tell, it is a rather large device, and that's why we can cool all the water that is going through and then ultimately cooling the miners. So, so Dennis, these two lines over here, is that a hot side and a cold side, and are those just shutoff handles to work on it? Exactly. Valves. And, uh, they have sensors that can allow us to monitor what the temperature of the water going in is and then what the water coming back is so that we can make certain the dry cooler is doing its job and whether or not we need to make any adjustments or any maintenance. Yep. And the, the dry cooler itself has a very sophisticated control system in there. So in the winter time, we won't need to have each bank running. You know, it'll actually shut down two or three banks if it's cooling it down to the target temperature. Okay. So, and the sensors, is that like an on-pipe sensor or it's a smart sensor where it's, you know, it, it's sending you data like in a dashboard or you can access it, you know, like a web user interface? Yes. We monitor that as part of my overall mining management software. What miner software are you using? Miner management software? Um, it's the mining management software that we developed in-house. Okay. So, we don't really have a name for it, okay. but it allows me to manage uh, keep an eye on what the hash rate is, what the fan speeds are, uh, or the temperature rather of the in, in immersion. We're not monitoring the fan speed, but in my air-cooled units, we do monitor the fan speed. It keeps track of the temperature of each of the chips, what hash port, each individual hash port, as well as the temperature so that we can get a sense if we need to shut some miners down or reduce their power consumption during a hot period and then overclock it later on at night. When are you going public with that? I mean, me and, me, and the, me and the people, we want we want it. Well, as of right now, it's used for internal use only for any of the clients that we manage their farms for. Fine. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> so again, this is a larger build out, larger cool, mining dry cooler. But if you were to get just one of the three high enclosures, DCX sells separate dry coolers for a smaller build out. So in one, each one of these dry coolers is designed for one of those enclosures. So we have three of those from a, an older build out that we pulled out as a, that we had originally running as a test. This is more my speed, you know. <laughs> it's, it's great, they are very quiet. Basically, you've got your radiator and then just a couple of fans. So in a residential environment, they're not gonna make a lot of noise. Uh, they do take up some space, but they don't take up much power and they don't make much noise. For me, they're actually one of the systems that I was looking at on this scale because basically deploying like uh, one column is kind of like my goal with the personal immersion mining deployment. Personally, not to you know derail the mining farm tour, which is way cooler than anything I've ever done, but with my mining shed, I was planning originally to air cool it, and then I got the pod, and the pod's not working right, and now, and it's, but before it stopped working correctly, I was like, okay, now I'm gonna make the mining shed an immersion mining shed. And so I was, I've was, i been working on the research and prep. This kind of sounds cheesy, but when people are like, are like, is it too late to mine? Like, should I get into mining, this, that, whatever? I'm like, honestly, man, like, it's true, like the best day to mine was probably yesterday. 
and the next best time is right now and tomorrow is going to be the next like best time like just the sooner you can start mining the sooner you can get your gear operational especially if you already have it generally speaking you'll mine more coin this year than you will in future years and you know obviously nobody knows but on average cryptocurrencies continue to go up in price year over year over year so if i can stack more coins today you know hopefully i let it ride out and we have a bright you know fruitful future that's what we're all in the business for but you're <laughs> right the difficulty factor is just constantly increasing so that's one of the reasons we're going to be pulling out some of our poor performing s19s um, the 104s and replacing them with the XP 141s just to increase our hash rate in the same footprint we currently have. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So let's check out the transformer. Let's see what's what's feeding you the juice, you know. All right. How, how, how are you getting this electricity? We're pretty close to the power lines, which was a, a very nice added bonus. Was that strategic or, or was that fortune, good fortune? It's very hard to find property that you can afford that's the right size. I mean, you can find industrial property, but they want 50 to 100,000 square feet. And we need a lot of power, but not much square feet. So this, I think, was more fortunate rather than necessarily planned, although it is one of the factors used when you're deciding on where do you want to put your mining farm. And how long has, have, you, have you guys been in this building? So we are coming up right on one year. We had to wait for a number of things. Supply chain certainly is, uh, is something. When we were in the process of acquiring miners, Bitcoin was quite high. Everybody yeah. was trying to get in it. So you had a problem getting miners. You had problems getting switch gear. Our power company, Dominion, had tremendous difficulty in getting a transformer. Um, we were fortunate enough that we were able to have our build out in a position that we could actually kind of take this transformer that was scheduled for somebody else and they brought it to us because we begged them enough. <laughs> you know, whatever gets it done. And in order to move that forward, we actually took care of some of the infrastructure ahead of time where we put in the pad, we dug the underground pits for the uh, cabling and things of that nature. It's, everybody knows this, but it's, to just like really simplify, it's like time like really is money, time is coin when it comes to mining. And especially if you've already started the build, you're paying the building rent, you know, you, you've got gear sitting here idly. It, it's, you're losing so much per day that sometimes, you know, if you have idle gear and things of that nature, that to step up and just pour the pad may absolutely be the right choice if that gets you operational that much quicker. I mean, it's cool to see you making, you know, the, the tough decisions on things like that too, to, you know, just you know, get it running. That's definitely a lot of heat. That's a lot of power. And that is dedicated just to our mining farm. What's that box over there? So initially the previous deployment support team, if you will, for this mine had brought in cable service. And even though we have nearly 500 miners. Um, you don't need that much bandwidth from an internet perspective, but what we found is that there was a fair amount of downtime due to the internet connectivity. So we pushed hard and we were able to bring in a business fiber connection. And since then we're getting a static IP and we're getting you know, very consistent bandwidth, even though we're using maybe one tenth of the actual bandwidth we're paying for the reliability is really key to, uh, to making this go because if you're paying the electricity and you have the miners set up, if you can't communicate to the pool, that's not gonna do you any good, so. Yeah, because in your internet downtime, um, you know, if you get blips in your connection, you're dropping shares, you're, you're literally losing your, your work and, and mining, it's, it's proof of work and all of that just simply translates to you're mining less coin you're probably still burning just as much power um, and it's, it's just decreasing your operations efficiency and earnings. Yeah, if you, if you have any latency in that connection and you're getting back to that pool, but some other miner actually solved that problem first, they get credit, you get nothing. So in that situation, that's where your internet connectivity is impacting it and you are burning the same amount of power. 
In some circumstances here, we were actually out for a few hours at a time. And what that'll do is it'll actually have the miners shut down because they're not receiving any work to do. So you're not using as much power, but you're certainly not making any money because you're not solving any problems. And really like what some people don't know is when it comes to especially solving a block and things like that in mining, like I could have the correct equation to solve the block for the next Bitcoin block, building the blockchain, and, and that gets you the earnings. That's how you earn with mining. And Dennis could also have it. And if we're both running there and then I trip because my internet connection sucks and he makes it because his internet connection is good, I get nothing and he gets everything. And that's just how important the internet connection is when it comes to mining. And I don't want to take it from you, Fosk, but I'm happy to take it from any other miner that's out there. <laughs> hey, I respect that. <laughs> Thank you. That is actually, um, I've got to get a key and stuff. That's where the internet is. This is where the power came in. Okay. So as part of the power distribution, when they came to set the transformer, we also had to set disconnect area here. This, yes. is, this is actually powered on this bottom side by the power company, because this is very high voltage. From this point over into the switch gear, our electrical company wound up terminating that. And um, then we have the meter over here that runs very, very fast <laughs> because we are using a lot of juice. And you actually multiply that reading. That's, that's not the real reading. You actually have to use a multiplier factor on that to get the true amount of power we're pulling. Wow. All right, Dennis, so what are you hiding up here? Well, secret stuff. We have some nice storage area up here for one. And while we do most of our monitoring and management from my main office, not from the farm itself, yeah, uh, we did set up a temporary area here so that we can be monitoring all of the conditions of the miners as well. You can see some of my L3 acquisitions that never made it to deployment because they wound up being non-profitable before I found enough power for them. So that was, as That's... every miner has their problems, but all over there are the boxes from the 500 S19s. So that if we ever need to pull them out and sell them, we would have the original boxes still available. A, a rookie mistake when people get into mining is they toss that box and then you realize how difficult it is to ship that yeah. without like this simple cut foam. I've tried to ship miners not in that because I was like, oh, I'll save space. I don't know, I'll throw this box away. And then I ship the miner, the fans break and the other issues when it gets shipped because th those fan shrouds are really brittle, you know, and you know the shipping companies don't care. They're in the warehouse seeing how far they can throw the box. I really like never see issues when miners are shipped in that basic foam. Yeah, uh, and you imagine where they're coming from and I know what happens with some of those delivery guys, even when they're bringing them into my office, they're not really gentle and we haven't had any damage due to shipping Fortunately, so it's that like, has been extremely well. That's all you can ask. But that, that's a thing a lot of like uh, newer miners overlook, uh, not only just keeping the box, but also, I mean, that's a pretty big footprint. Obviously you have a lot of miners here, which is very cool, but you know, you're like the next guy who wants to build a 500 Bitcoin miner farm. Well, do you have space for this? Cause it's a, it's a lot. Yeah. Obviously, you, you could really break them down and try to save some space, but wow, you're going to start really burning up time on labor. Yeah, I mean, we had the space, um, so therefore we, we just kept them that way. And to be honest, a lot of this is actually my own gear that I've brought over here. I have a relationship with the owner and he allowed me to bring some of this here. But what we do is we just take a look, whether we're here or whether we're at our office, we have temperature gauges so that we can actually see the general temperature in the facility itself so we can kind of get a gauge from that standpoint so my different uh, facilities are showing those temperatures and then i take a look here on a constant basis so that i can see how each miner is performing i've color coded it to determine what their hash rate is the ones that are currently in a goldenrod or orange are actually reduced uh, performance because our temperature is up right now so they are scaling back automatically right now and then later tonight when the temperature cools off they will automatically get fired to start up again and they'll come back to their full performance it's really cool to see like you made this 
That's, that's, that's very cool. Yeah, and, and the actual layout actually correlates to the pods downstairs. So I can tell in each miner where it's located in the enclosure by looking at that grid. I also have this viewpoint, which is actually showing the miner temperatures. So I can see which miners are running hotter than others. And they're again color coded, where at night you'll see these and many of them will be dark green because they'll be less than 70 Fahrenheit. And that's where you really want to start cranking it up because the miner performance is really triggered based upon how much heat that miner is having to dissipate. Are they like that green color down there? Yes. Or it gets even darker than yeah, that? Yeah, uh, that actually is the darker green. And those particular miners are in an air conditioned area. And so that's why those 141s are running very, very cool. Shameless plug, Boss Queen Green. I like what you chose. There you go. <laughs> and then if we need to, um, if I were to click on one, then I actually get more detail of each individual miner that is in that particular row. And I can do things like click on that and that will give me the average hash rate over the past two weeks. So I can see what was this miner performing a couple of weeks ago versus what is that miner performing now? Has something changed? This is really cool. Thank you. And then we also have this performance, which this is gonna tell me how many joules or how many watts per tera hash I'm getting. So that's my performance factor up here. My target is going to be 30. And so you'll see that I'm going up and down over that 30 over time. You'll also see my hash rate over the past day, how much power is being consumed, and the temperature. And you can see throughout the day, that temperature, those miners are getting warmer. And you can see that my hash rate is going to take a, take a hit as well, my performance. Uh, then we also are calculating the shares and a difficulty factor of each share, what that difficulty was to acquire that particular share. So what is the target temperature? Like in a perfect world, what is a Bitcoin miner running at temperature wise? We run Brain Software and their targets are 60 degrees Fahrenheit is gonna be basically the low end. Once it gets to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that gets it into the hot. And then 90 degrees Fahrenheit is the danger zone and that's when the miners will actually shut down. I've run a lot of my gear over 90. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Over the years, especially my original mining shed was just very rudimentary. Um, it was hot in there. Yes. It was real hot. So that's very cool to hear and see. When we were having those heat problems in my air-cooled facilities, um, I actually have what I call auto miner, uh, a, a series of scripts that are constantly pulling. This data is pulled every 10 minutes for every miner, stored in a database, and I then query that database on a constant basis. And with the stock firmware from Brains, what I would do is, Brains ultimately came out with the sleep mode. I would actually force them into sleep mode when they got that hot, and then I would keep checking and then go ahead and fire that. Brains has the dynamic performance scaling right now, and the DPS actually is doing that in their software automatically. So do you think Brains is killing it? Like, is, is their firmware really cool? Like, is it, is it worth it? Because there's an associated dev fee, and you know we need to clear the dev fee I would think at a minimum to switch, right? Well, it um, depends on what you're paying in a pool fee because if you are mining with Brain software and you go to the Brain's pool, they compensate you, credit you back the dev fee. So you don't pay a dev fee as long as you're mining to the Brain's pool. If oh. you mine somewhere else, you are going to pay that 2.5%. And well. one of the things is with being in this level of a, a facility, we're a preferred partner with Brain's. So we're getting direct, immediate response to any issues we might have. And they've been extremely responsive. We've been very happy with Brains. We've used Venus, we've used Stock, you know, we've used several others. Um, we're really happy with the Brains as it is right now. Yeah, I've had some lim limited dealings with Brains over the years, and uh, they've always just seemed cool, down to earth, and just they're, they're those OG Bitcoin guys, you know, and, and that's overall, they're a really good addition to the space. Um, with what they're doing. A lot of open source work and things like that as well. The Brains Mining Pool, formerly known as Slush Pool, is the original Bitcoin mining pool, which, I mean, you just have to put some respect on that, you know, period. And you're right, they do put out a lot of 
technical papers and things of that nature to try to help you make sure you're maximizing the performance out of your miner. And this does auto-tune, so part of the brain software is an auto-tuning where it will go through and try to find on a chip level that maximum. Now Venus and some of the others have that ability, but you have to generally set those yourself, whereas this has an auto-tuning feature. Awesome. So, And to bring it back to your software, yeah. if you don't mind me asking, let me, how long did it take you to you know, have a functional you know, product? Like, what, what kind of input did that have on your end? So this has been over a year in the development and we've modified it over time. Uh, initially, I wrote it for the L3s, then the S19s came out, that was a different interface. Then we go to Venus, that's a different interface. Go to Brain, so every software is going to return the data in a little bit different fashion. So it's an ongoing process, and I'm constantly tweaking it and trying to improve it. You've been you've been busy. Yeah, I've been I've been busy. Been busy. And in addition to that, we're also doing board level and chip level repairs on S19s now. So that is really you know something we're getting into. I think some of your viewers might be interested to see what these things look like pulled apart, not just the hash board pulled out, but actually separated. So if you'd like, we can go take a look at that and you can have Colby show you that. Let's go. All right. So kind of in the in this area, you've got your normal electronics repair stuff, right? So you've got your multimeter, give your voltage, everything like that. Uh, outside of the specific stuff, we've got a microscope set up, which is really crucial when you're identifying stuff like this. I have good eyesight but even to tell which, if any of the pads are messed up on it, you've got to use something like a microscope. How many repairs have you done here? So the way that miners work is a lot of them fail very quickly and then nothing fails for a long time and then you get the weird stuff coming in over time. Um, so I would say probably 500 miners here. We've had 50 failed hash boards, so do the math it's you know 17 miners have failed at one 17 specific hash boards and so what we've done is we've pulled out failed ones and put them into different ones and kind of Frankenstein them yeah exactly and that's where we learned stuff like they all need to have the magic firmware um, yeah. so yeah I would say there's probably been between 40 and 50 failed hash boards for one reason or another surprisingly low but um, still annoying very annoying so I think the immersion helps with that because it keeps the temperature fluctuations down. They're very yeah. clean when they come out. Generally, the things that have failed would have failed regardless whether they were in immersion or air. Yeah. And it's not like specifically. The only downside with the immersion is it specifically makes them repairing more difficult. Uh, and messy. And messy. And the stuff that actually dissolves the dielectric is nasty. It's like a kerosene. It'll eat your hands. It's not good. Why are my hands burning? <laughs> Just a little bit of carcinogens. Yeah. You'll be uh, all right for a couple years. But it doesn't smell bad, which is great. Uh, That's but yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, we got one pro. Yeah. One pro. Two it, pros. It works. eat your hands. And it smells, doesn't smell bad. And so these are actually the dye masks for the Bitmain chips themselves. So this is for the chip BM1398. And so each of those solder points, you put the chip in there, which is that chip. And those are all the solder connections that have to be made that are underneath this board. See that? That's very cool. I haven't, those, I haven't seen one in person. It's impossible to do by hand, something like that. I mean, yeah, smaller than your thumbnail. Smaller than your thumbnail. This is basically a traditional um, rework electronic setup with just a few specialty tools. Um, so nothing nothing out of the ordinary outside of your weird, you know, kind of unique testers, but you know, all of this kind of stuff is common. Um, we've got a laboratory power supply that's on the other side. It's not in here right now. The most difficult thing about the repair world in general is the lack of documentation. Yeah. There's none. The stuff that's in there is in Chinese. Yeah. The translations are garbage. Um, and even with the tools, all of the documentation for all of the tools is in Chinese. You just gotta figure it out. So you just gotta figure it out. And so that is the absolute, the hardest part. Um, I don't know if you saw on the tester, but all the menus are in Chinese. Yeah. Good luck. I, I just thought you knew it. Nope. You're still Mandarin on the side. I wish I would've. Not too late. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's just not gonna be fun. Not gonna be fun. No, no. And so, yeah, that's the, the this, worst the worst part. This is really cool to see. These are all, obviously, these are spare components. These are the actual parts for passports. Um, so this is for an S19G Pro. You got your... Thanos is back again. Yeah, so these are just where the hashboard plugs go in. So if the hashboard connector breaks off. We're out of chips. We are We are out of chips. Get Doritos on the line. Free to lay. Come on. <laughs> okay, I can't show you those. This is the most common thing. These are temperature sensors. Um, so if you've, I'm sure you've experienced it with some of the hash boards, like can't read temperature sensor and you're like, oh, it's dead. Yeah. It's a little tiny part. They fail all the time. Um, and they're one of the easier components to replace because they're visible. You don't take the hash boards off or the heat sinks off. And they're, they're big. Yeah. I mean, big. Big for the, big for, big for the electronic. Yeah. Big for the electronic board. world. Um, cool. <clears throat> so, I don't know if you ever tried your hand at it, but... It's on the to-do list. I have a couple bad failing boards. It's a can I've kicked down the road. Because <laughs> it, is, it is honestly quite difficult. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to get into. Again, it's one of those, there are training facilities, but all of the tools and all the stuff's in different language. And uh, even from the people I've spoken to who native Chinese speakers, the instructions are still bad. <laughs> but that, that's as bad as it gets. Yeah. That's as bad as it They're gets. They're bad in the original language and then worse translated. <laughs> so you kind of got to figure it out. There's, you know, telegram groups, discord groups. They're like everybody trying to help each other out, which is yeah. surprising um, in the mining world. That's the cool. mining repair world it seemed to be the most egalitarian. Everybody's trying to actually help each other, which is always nice to see. That's awesome. So, Colby, one thing you were showing me were, was the, uh, the PDU, yeah. and you are kind of running through the components and what you do if you're having an issue with your PDU. And I think it's really interesting just the fact that you're doing this on site instead of just swapping a whole unit, because you're, you're cutting a lot of cost by replacing a component instead of a whole, whole PDU. And especially if you have spare parts on hand, yeah. you're cutting your downtime exponentially. So if you can see on the front here, um, and kind of just go top to bottom, you got the wiring feeds in from the service panels, which I know you saw with Dennis earlier, um, right across the top here. And they feed into basically a bus. So what it does is connects this external wiring down into the internal wiring behind here. The wires go in here. This is a failed one, obviously. <laughs> uh, there was an issue. And then these basically are just pass-throughs. So a white wire comes here, goes all the way through, comes out the bottom. So Colby, I appreciate you showing me that stuff. I, I guess my final question, I have two questions. What's, what's your favorite thing related to working in on mining farms that like you've dealt with? What, what's so what probably comes to mind? the challenges of doing new things every day. Um, so you go through and it's never the same problem twice. For better and worse. For better or worse. <laughs> You're always learning. Um, we have a lot of specialties here that kind of intermingle that you wouldn't get in most other fields. So like high pressure, high temperature plumbing, electrical, you know, electrical high voltage and low voltage, like the electronics level to the like power grid level. And so being able to combine all those things on top of the normal IT world that we're used to is really an interesting combination. You're glutton for punishment. Yeah. <laughs> Never do the same thing twice, right? Keep you busy. Absolutely. And what's your least favorite thing? What sucks? You know, um, cleaning the oil, getting it off of your skin yeah. is probably the worst thing. Um, it's a great, it's absolutely ideal as long as you don't have to touch it. Yeah, so. well put. So I appreciate you walking through all this uh, stuff yeah. with me, Colby. And uh, it was a pleasure. A pleasure, so. thank you. <laughs> Dennis, it's been an incredible pleasure to tour this facility today and run through everything. Do, like one last question, kind of like, wait, what's your favorite part about all this? You know, as we kind of close this out, what, what, what's, what brings the joy? What's fun? So I started my first IT consulting practice in 1979. So I've been doing this for a very long time. One of the reasons I got into that industry is that there was always a challenge. There was always something new that I was having to learn. So it's that entertaining part 
Nowadays, IT is pretty much a run of the mill type of service at this point. Crypto mining, on the other hand, has rejuvenated me and, in, and that same level of interest and that change and that constant learning and my having to learn so many more things than just the technical is issues, right? You have to factor in the financial aspects and, you know, what is crypto doing? What is the performance of the miners? What are other currencies doing? So there's so much more that I'm learning these days and uh, it just really keeps me energized and, and really makes it enjoying. I think that's really cool to hear, especially with just the length of experience you have. And it's interesting, you know, you were in IT so early and that's yes. really cool. Yes. And, and that's- We used an abacus to start with. <laughs> and that, and that's- uh, An abacus, but, by the way, is those things with little beads. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, look it up on the internet. But- Which in, didn't exist back then. Woo! Uh, <laughs> that is easy, easy. <laughs> No, everyone's gonna hurt their feelings. It's cool to see someone like you who was like very forward thinking to get into IT then shows like, you know, that, that you're into like the new emerging thing that you're forward thinking that you can see where, where things are going. And if you can see something like that in cryptocurrency, like th that's, that's exciting. It's interesting to maybe think of cryptocurrency like kind of like the new IT world because IT is so norm normalized now. Uh, and, and you know, popular and common, accessible, yeah. uh, and, and it didn't used to be that way. It's exciting to hear that you find this so challenging coming from such a technical background as well, uh, which speaks to how this, this is different and interesting. And, mm -hmm. and if, if anything, if nothing else, it's a testament to just your intelligence that like you enjoy like complex problems, you know, and solving them. It, Cause this, this isn't easy, it's difficult, it's weird. There's not a lot of documentation and if nothing else, you need to have good problem solving skills to be involved with this, especially at the level that, that you've taken it right. to. And fortunately, much like Akil said, we have a good team that we've built up, not only Colby, but others back at the office that uh, enable us to be able to do the level of support that we're providing, not only here, but at our other facilities as well. So what's the worst part? What's, what's the what, worst what, part? What's, what's well, tough about I, I this? Mean, I, I will go back to what Akil said, and that is that no, unfortunately- You can't take his I, answer. I have to take his answer because- you can, they, ask, I'm gonna ask you, you the know, question again. We all know crypto's in you know, a little bit of a tough, tough spot right now, but you know, from, from the glory days. But we are in it for the long haul. We expect it to come back, and we're looking forward to those days where everybody can sit back and be happy about what we've built and what we're doing and what we're contributing to the uh, proof of work effort. Perseverance pays off in so many categories. I hope that this is also gonna be one of those. So, Dennis, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. And thanks to you if you watch the video, cause this is gonna be a hell of a video. This is gonna be a long one. So as always, thanks for tuning in. And uh, Dennis, should they subscribe? Absolutely, subscribe. <laughs> yeah, take that. I, I do. I didn't say it this time. So I'll see you all later.